Hello and welcome to 15 Minutes on Grenache. We're going to look at the history of Grenache in Australia, the regions where it grows, well, the major regions because it grows in quite a few. We're going to talk a bit about blending and uh, the real key thing here is the evolution of style and you'll see what we mean by that. So Australia has actually been one of the original varieties that came to Australia. It's been there since 1832. It did really well in the early days, thrived in the warmer regions, which is where kind of the early settlements were. Historically formed the backbone of the classic dry red wines of Australia, then became extremely important in fortified wine production. There was a few decades there where fortified wines were kind of the big deal in Australia. That's what was being drunk and it's what was being exported. But then it's sort of come out of the shadows a little bit. And the, the brilliant thing about Grenache right now is that it's not just a supporting cast member anymore. It's kind of the star of the show. It's evolved into a brilliant single variety. And uh, I think it's really one of the sneaky superstars of these classic varieties that have been in Australia pretty much since the beginning. Um, growing it, we've actually got a specialist that can talk about that. Pete Fraser from um, uh, Yangara is going to join us shortly. Uh, but it's grown in Australia, um, usually typically very traditionally grown in these old bush, these goblet, goblet sort of bush vines, meaning not a lot of supporting trellising system. It just does really well with that sort of uh, old school growing uh, method. Copes well in these hot conditions. And generally, you can grow Grenache fairly successfully without irrigation. And you have to sort of manage the pruning a little bit. One of the key things about it, and this probably applies to a lot of different varieties, but very much so with Grenache, if you let the yields get too high, you end up with simple fruity wines. Um, the, if you balance out the yields, and I think Pete's going to talk a bit about this, is getting that sort of balance in the vineyard is really the, kit, the, the critical element to having that balance between concentration, flavor, and character. Uh, two major regions. It's grown in others, but there are two sort of hotbeds of Grenache production, largely due to the old vines and the history, but that's Barossa and McLaren Vale. And we'll look at those briefly, a little quick 10,000 foot view. Barossa Valley, just situated there north of Adelaide, one of the most, arguably one of the most famous regions in Australia. Uh, long, long history with Grenache. Some of the oldest Grenache vineyards in the world exist in Barossa. Uh, many, many hundred plus year old vines there. In fact, the oldest vineyard of Grenache anywhere on the planet exists in Barossa. It's uh, planted in uh, 1848, Marco Cirillo's 1848 vineyard there. So that's kind of cool. Um, does really well in this warmer sort of Mediterranean climate of the Barossa. And you'll see this, uh, what's been emerging is the sandy soil sites in the region. And uh, we'll talk about that in McLaren Vale as well. The style in Barossa has evolved as well can range from um, medium to full bodied and fragrant right through to the full sort of classic, almost a bit old school, um, rich and spicy versions of, uh, of Grenache. And then McLaren Vale. Like Brossett, lots of old vine uh, vineyard sites there. Shiraz, certainly the most extensively planted variety in uh, McLaren Vale, but Gren Grenache has almost sort of become the signature variety of the region. It sort of separated itself. Several producers credited with the reshaping of the style and image of Grenache. We'll talk to one of them today and his Im impressions on that. And this is the region that initially made me stop and pay attention to this variety as a single varietal wine, just with the full range of styles that, uh, that this uh, variety is capable of producing. I feel like historically we thought Grenache was sort of in this narrow band, big, full-bodied, fairly alcoholic wines. We're seeing the sort of uh, gastronomic profile of, uh, of Grenache expanding quite a, quite a bit. It's, uh, it's brilliant. And I love this. I think it's a really exciting variety. Quick mention of the historical sort of reference here, because this is still really important as well, and its contributions to what you would consider a very, very classic blend in Australia. Um, even before we identified these as varietal sort of blends, this was sort of classic dry red wine. Grenache gives you this spice and flavour, lovely red fruit character and fragrance. It does give you a little bit of alcohol if you if you manage it carefully. Morvedro or Mataro, as we often call it, gives you perfume and these grippy, grippy sort of tannins. And then Shiraz in the blend tends to give this mouth weight and richness. But Grenache always forms the backbone here. But let's get more into this with uh, an expert in the field, Pete. Are you there, beaming in live from McLaren Vale? I am on, on a cold, wintry day. Um, it's good to be inside. You don't know what cold is in Australia. Come on, you have to admit it. Anyway, very, great, to very see, great to see you. I know you're a lover of Grenache, which is why we have you here. Um, but 
like many, I mean, it's it's this. It's almost like Grenache as a single varietal wine. It's always been a really important variety for us in in Australia, but in specifically McLaren Vale, it's almost like had a bit of a coming out party as a single varietal um, uh, wine. Do you find it easy to work with? Do you like working with it as a grape variety? Um, I think as a single variety, what what makes it really special is that um, it's it's very special vineyards that can showcase itself as a single variety. Um, I think in, in Europe it's been predominantly blended um, and I think the great vineyards in Europe are, are often um, as a single varietal and, and I think that's one of the big call, calls for, for a McLaren Vale or Brossa Shiraz especially. Um, <clears throat> and it's, um, it's just showing so many great things in terms of um, side expression it's um I, I call it a chameleon variety in the fact that it it really shows a, a sense of place um and it shows the touch of the winemaker so as a winemaker it's it's one of those holy grail varieties because you you kind of have to really be so uh sensitive in the way you make it and um and and to bring out all those all those side expressions without showing your heavy hand or, or showing your sensitivity to the right. wine. Yeah, we'll get into the winemaking first book uh, in a moment rather, but I wanted to ask a bit about um, growing it and getting it right in the vineyard. Whenever I've, I've talked to you about this, I've talked to other winemakers and grape growers, what is it about, what do you need to get right in the vineyard? Do, do you think old vines matter, for example? Do you think that matters? Um, we always bang on about old vines, but does it matter? Like I said about it's kind of showing its sense of place um site is an incredible thing and we're so lucky that you know in the you know whether it be the late 1800s whether it be the 1900s that the simplicity of farming back then is Grenache is a very drought tolerant variety so farmers actually generally planted Grenache in areas that were really tough going it didn't grow very good grass it didn't grow very good um you know whether it be grain crops or or other horticultural produce um, this Grenache was kind of put there because nothing much else grew there. Uh, so when you look awesome. into the kind of time now where we're seeing a bit of global warming, less, you know, reliable rainfall, Grenache is saying, hey, bring it on. Um, and, and so we got these old plantings in incredibly, um, you know, hard soils. And, and, and as a result of that, as we know with a lot of other varieties, when they start to do it tough, they really start to, to showcase this incredible concentration. If they're really looked after, they might show some beautiful perfume and fragrance and elegance even. Um, and, and so that part of it, is is kind of non-negotiable then it's kind of like the little things it's the you know maybe it might be the biological farming you know managing the soil so that it's it's got as much microbiological activity as it can so it can actually kind of be as healthy and showcase the the mineralogy of the soil um then it's you know managing the pruning so the crop yields are, are right so that it is kind of showing its best um and whether that be balance and, you know, fruit exposure, all those kind of technical side of things um, are incredibly important. And then probably add that to the top of the list is, is when you're picking it. Um, you know, yeah. gone are those days of, you know, hanging out there and getting big ripe tannins, but coming with that is, you know, jamminess and, and out high alcohol. And, you know, I think there's a, a revolution of, of these bright, vibrant wines, but, Having said that, there's also a revolution of, of Grenache with, a, with this beautiful, fine, um, sometimes a little bit, um, you know, um, robust tannins that, that give these wines incredible length and, and, and possibly even longevity for some of those really special sites. No, I think that's the thing I think that's been so surprising for, for a lot of people, myself included, where you, we thought Grenache sat in this little box here and, and actually it's, it's, it's much broader and there's almost, you know, some of the old school Bross producer call it warm climate Pinot, which I thought was weird at first. And then you go, oh, it's not so, not as weird as it sounds. It is definitely a, a variety that can be medium to full bodied and fragrant and, and all the way to through, through, through to yeah, and and it, and it has a lot of kind of, I think, varietal commonality to Pinot Noir and yeah. Nebbiolo. Yeah. Um, and, and, and both of those varieties also have this incredible 
you know, delicate touch of winemaking and also very much show their sense of place. And um, Yeah, get into the winemaking because that's something that's really changed, hasn't it, or at least there's been more attention to it. Because I remember Mm. you talked to me a a while ago and and we were talking about Taris. Unfortunately, we lost him, but you said he made you brave. What did you mean by that? Because I think that feeds into this sort of idea is that a, was that a picking decision was that just winemaking that made you brave and what did that mean to you by being brave look i, I think he'd drawn some inspiration by some some very clever winemaking um in the south of france um and um you know he was doing some some extended skin maceration i think he had a um has a grenache called um 186 or 181 I think it was and um, which was the first time he made that wine in the amount of days that it was on skins um, he was you know really pushing the boundaries and and he was a winemaker that kind of cut his teeth in the Adelaide Hills but you know loved Grenache and and was really because of that probably quite the master at it as as well as just being an amazing ambassador and an amazing mentor to many people um even even if you weren't actually that close like somebody like myself i you know took took a great leaf out of many of his things that he did um but the winemaking look there's so many people that are doing some great things um I, you know I, if i said names I, i'd be missing too many people um but um you know I, and i i kind of have cut our own kind of from a winemaking perspective i've, I've really been um very cognizant of of tannin and length and you know we talked about the different styles it's you know if you pigeonhole burgundy to one style you'd be missing kind of you know um missing a lot of the picture um there's bright delicious low tannin early drinking grenaches that are just wonderful bistro style wines then there's you know wines that have incredible length and 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 structure that um, but still have this fragrance and elegance that that probably got ten to twenty to maybe even thirty years in the cellar potential, um, and the winemaking as a result is going to really change. And I think there's there's things that we've taken out of whether it be Pinot Noir or Nebbiolo winemaking or even Chateau Neuf winemaking. Um, you know whether that be a small amount of bunches or in our case where we don't do much bunch, um, where we're looking for a, for a, a slightly um, you know our our own niche style but the one thing that they're all doing is there really isn't much new oak um there isn't much oxidative handling so you're really looking to preserve that that fragrance and beauty of the variety and it's and it's the salt and pepper things whether it be um you know uh, how much bunch you're doing the time on skins the the um uh and then the type of vessels, you know, it might be large format, um, you know, and some producers, they're not making very much. So it might be small, old bricks. Um, that's fine too. Uh, we're using, you know, people are using concrete, people are using ceramic eggs. Um, and But they all have something in common that it's relatively sensitive, um, careful wine making, lots of topping, um, you know, making sure that the wine isn't, isn't aging for too long in barrel and then oxidative and, and being bottled as a relatively young wine. Um, so I just feel like as a, as a whole, McLaren Vale, Barossa, especially that represent the majority of the plantings, the winemakers are taking it very seriously and their attention to detail. It's, it's often, if you talk to those winemakers, one of their favorite varieties to make. So they're giving it all this attention to detail, which is making it shine. And you see it, you see it in the wines now. And I feel like mm. it was this, it was the, it was the cousin you didn't talk about, <laughs> like the workhorse variety. And now it's just, uh, I'd be, I would be embarrassing myself if I spoke about how much Grenache I drink on a sort of a monthly basis. Which which is not a bad thing, but mate, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that insight. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, hopefully I can get down and, and visit and taste some more Grenache in the next little while, but um, just to sort of wrap things up here a little bit. Um, so we've had a good look at Grenache and had some amazing insight from, uh, from Pete here, but think a few things. When you think Grenache in Australia, think old vines, think that history and heritage that exists. We've got some of the oldest vines on the planet. Think Barossa from McLaren Vale. Think elegance, power and perfume, how you make that little dancing on that tightrope of power and perfume. Grenache does it beautifully. And do what I do. Think about that second bottle because you're going to need it.
Great. We'll see you next time in another episode of 15 Minutes On.